you are at Beyond the Manifest, applying the genealogical proof standard to confirm one's ancestral origins. Um, one other bit of housekeeping I just wanted to mention, there is a handout. You should be able to access it either on that big thing that looks like a shoehorn. <laughs> it's actually a thumb drive of some sort. I want to call it a thumb drive, but it doesn't look like one. Uh, and uh, the handout, or you can also access the handout through your app. Uh, and all the citations that I mention, all the references, are in the handout, so you should not have to wildly scribble anything down. Okay? It's all in there. Okay, so we're going to do a little survey. So how many of you have ever had any trouble identifying your, your village of, of origin? Yeah, that's, that's something that's very typical. Um, and for those of you with that problem, how many had that problem because the name of the village was very similar for a number of different communities? Yeah. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on today, that kind of problem. I am one of the moderators for the uh, Jewish genealogy, this Jewish gen discussion group. I've done that for several years. And one of the things I started noticing is that this, a lot of times certain questions come up again and again and again, that people really have this interest or this problem. And one of the problems, I, just for fun, I, I looked at about six months of archives in the Jewish Gen discussion group and discovered that actually this type of question was asked in a 40, in a, 40 times in a six month period. Now this was a few years ago. I don't think it's changed. So this is definitely a problem that not only all of us in this room, many of us in this room, but many of us trying to do Jewish genealogy have. We're all needing some help in this regard. And when we do Jewish genealogy, there really are two questions that we need to answer before we can jump the pond and go back to wherever our ancestors came from originally. The main questions are, what was the family surname in the old country? And the second question is, where did the family live in the old country? And I know, you know, I, I see this in a lot of times with beginners, and I know most of you are not beginners, but Beginners just want to jump the pond almost immediately, and you have to, as an experienced genealogist, you have to say to them, whoa, please don't do that. You can't, you have to know so much more about your immigrant ancestors before you try to do that. So my suggestion is, it, my, my topic for today really is going to be focusing on where did your family live? Can we really doc, figure that out in a documentary fashion? Can we, can we really know for sure? And as, as well as we can know anything in genealogy before we try to go back to the old country. And an ancillary question to that is, are we using rigorous methods and techniques to prove our case? That's really the crux of the issue. So today, what I want to speak about really is how do we build a case for a particular community when we have conflicting information about its location? And I'm going to look at something called the genealogical proof standard as a method of approaching this problem, and I will explain what this is. Very slightly, I'll touch on research planning and evidence analysis with regard to this question. I will give you a case study example that we'll go through through most of the talk. And my hope is that several of the resources that I will talk about are perhaps ones that you haven't thought to use previously or you haven't really fully explored. So we'll just charge on here. The first question is, when you're doing this, is, well, why can't we identify the name of the town? And of course, any time you've gotten into this, you know that there have been lots of boundary changes in Eastern Europe in particular. And that has also many times come along with language changes. And in addition to that, Jewish people often spoke not only the language of the area that a lot of other people spoke in the area, but they also had their own language, Yiddish. So you, there could be a number of different languages that are being spoken. Um, and just as an example, and the, these may be familiar to some of you, there's the town of Lemberg that was in the Austrian Empire. Many Jewish people, if you ask them where their family is from, they'll say Lemberg. Try to find that at a, on a map today, and you won't. That town has had several different names. 
When it was under Poland, it was called Lvov. When it was in the Russian Empire, it was called, or actually the Soviet Union, it was called Lvov, but spelled in Cyrillic. And of course, now in Ukraine, it's called Lviv. So four different names, okay, with different alphabets. Um, another good example is Novograd Volinsky. Now that's pretty much always been, for quite a while, been in the Russian Empire and then in the Soviet Union. Um, the, in Yiddish, that was called Jvil. So like completely different, nothing that you'd recognize. So those are the kind of things, you know, basic things that you, you need to understand. But we're even dealing with other difficult problems. So when I first started my research, they always say, you know, start at home. And that's what I did. And when I started at home, principally interested in my father's family, I was told that the town that they were from was called Lubin. And they said, oh, and, and it's near Kiev. Yeah. You know. We hear that a lot. It's kind of near Kiev. I can, I can tell you at this point that this town was near Kiev in the sense that it was closer to Kiev than it is to New York City. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's not really close. It's about 260 miles from, or kilometers rather, from Kiev. Um, but what seemed to be important for these people was that it was called Lubin, not Lubin. Okay. If you said to my, my grandfather, oh, so you're from Lubin, he would correct you and say, no, I was from Lubin. You know, Lu the pronunciation for some reason was very important. And I think it was because it was differentiating it from other places that had a similar spelling, but a different emphasis on the syllables. The other thing I knew going into this from my family was that there were some Lansmannschaft burial plots in the New York City area where many of my family members were interred. So just to give you a little background, and we'll talk about Lansmannschaft later, a Lansmannschaft, if you're not, how many of you are not familiar with a Lansmannschaft? Okay. A Lansmannschaft is a, a, an organization that was created by immigrants from usually the same community. It was a community association. It was a social welfare group, so they collected money if someone was having trouble in their lives and needed help. Um, but and, and a social group. And it was also a charitable organization. They might uh, collect money and send it to the old country to help their, their, uh, their lawnsmen. And the other thing that they did, which is really nice for genealogy, is that they often purchased burial plots for the community in local cemeteries. So those are the things that we worry about. Now, when I, when I first, there's been a number of, because it is useful uh, with all these cemetery plots, a number of different websites have looked at and different organizations have looked at Landsmannschaft in different cities. In New York City, um, there were set, when I first started my research, I found that this particular Landsmannschaft, where my family was buried, the first Lubiner Progressive Benevolence Association, don't ask me if there was a second because I don't think there was, uh, <laughs> and I don't know why it was progressive, but you see those kind of names in there. It had, probably had something to do with the times. Um, JGS New York, has a couple of databases. Um, they have one, uh, and I have to say that they still have these databases, and I believe that the um, URLs are accurate, and as I say, they are on the handout, so you don't need to write them down. Um, when I first looked at the, the first one, when I looked at that, what they wrote for the first Lubina Progressive Benevolent Association, they associated with the town of Lubny, which is a town currently in Ukraine. The second one, still on the same website, associated that same Landsmannschaft with Lublin, which is a much larger community, fairly well known in today's Poland. And then there's a website, I don't know if you, some of you are aware, it's a very nice website, it's like a virtual museum called Museum of, the, the, uh, museum of Family History. And that, what he did was he went around to all these different Lonsman shopped burial plots in New York City. He photographed the gates. The gates often have names of, of many of the members, or at least the officers, and posted them on his website. And he also associated this, these Lonsman shop, this Lonsman shop plots with Lubny. Uh, so those, that's what I've started with. Then I went to gazetteers, and gazetteers are 
well, they used to be mostly books, but now many of them are on, a, a, a very important one is online. Gazetteers list communities in an area and give you usually a short description uh, where it's located and uh, important information about the town, perhaps a little snippet of history. And those are really important when you're trying to figure out your town because you may be able to find the name and find various locations. Well, when I looked up Lubin, what I found was that in both Where Once We Walked and in another book called Encyclopedia of Jewish Life Before and during the Holocaust, which actually, the abridged version is three volumes. The huge version is probably many more of that, many more. There seem to be about three towns that kind of look like about the right one in terms of the name. I also looked at the online gazetteer, which many of you may be familiar, on Jewish Gen, which is the Jewish Gen Communities Database. That is also a gazetteer. The nice thing about it, as opposed to looking at a book, is it uses what's called, it can use what's called Soundex, which takes a name, think in its computerese, thinks about how it might sound, and gives you all the possibilities of what the name might have been based upon that sa those sounds. And when I put in the name Lubin into the, and Laboon, into the gazetteers, what I found was they gave me a choice of 22 towns, which was a lot. That it, I have to say that the Deitch Mokotov sound decks that they were using, or that they and they still use, does give you a lot of false positives. So I was able to kind of read through those, and it still seemed about three different towns that seemed to be kind of on the money for this. And those three towns, oops, hope you're not dead. Those three towns were Lubien Kuyaski, which is, you can see here's Warsaw, so it's just a little bit west of Warsaw. That one in Yiddish, and it, its nickname is Lubin. Um, then there's Lubni, which we heard about before, which also has the nickname of Lubin. Okay, the, and that's in today's Ukraine. And then there was Laboon. Um, that one I have not found that it had the nickname Lubin or was, or in Yiddish was known as Lubin. It was apparently known as Laboon. But those seem to be the ones that kind of popped up when you tried to identify what community it could possibly have been. The next thing I did, and these are all the things that we, you know, recommend people do when you're trying to figure out where your relatives were from, is I start, looked at all the family members I could think of. I looked at, you know, parents. Uh, grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, whoever were the immigrants who I knew were from the same community. And I tried to find as many of their records as I could that would be relevant to this question that might give me some information on what town they were from. So I looked for manifests and naturalization records. I looked for social security applications, which can often list the town of origin, census records, passports, draft registrations, all of those kind of records. When I did that, I came up with four words. They seem to be from either Lubin, Laboon, Volin, and Volinsk. Well, it quickly became clear to me that Volin and Volinsk were the province. And they are kind of Yiddish ways of saying Volhynia Gubernia, which was an area in the old Russian Empire, a province. So it became clear that the town names I was looking at were either Lubin or Laboon. And Laboon I could put on a map. Lubin I still couldn't quite figure out. The next thing I did was essentially what I call crowdsourcing information. So, as I said, a lot of people go to the Jewish Gen discussion group and they post their question and they say to people, I have this town, where could it have been? And they get people's opinions. And sometimes, you know, you don't really know who these people are. Sometimes they're well-known experts or acknowledged experts. Um, but most of the time when people give you an, an, an opinion, they don't really tell you why they think that's the case. They'll just say, well, it's got to be this one. Okay, and 
this was early on, probably about 2008, when I was starting very early on in my research. And I was kind of shy, so I didn't actually post a question myself. But what I did do, and in retrospect is probably a smarter method, is I looked at the archives, because there are archives for the Jewish Gen discussion group that you can access via Jewish Gen. And there's a search box. And I, in the search box, I put in Lubin and uh, Laboon. And what I found was that there were about four researchers who had been posting about either Laboon or Lubin since about 1995, through, through, which, went, which is about when the discussion group started, through about 2008 when I was searching. And those people seemed to use the term indis indiscriminately. You know, they seemed to act as though that was the same place. Um, I also found, which was interesting, a cousin among these four people. I had not known him before. I had heard his name from another relative uh, and had done some research. And so when his name popped up, I was like, oh, cool. He's interested in this stuff, too. We ultimately met, became pretty good friends and co-researchers. Um, his name is Peter Myers. And he told me that in 1928, his grandfather, Lewis, who was the immigrant, and his father, Bernard, who was born in the United States, went back to the old country on a trip. I think probably they were going back because the Landsmannschaft, like I was saying, they did a lot of charitable work to support the old country. They probably collected money from all these different places and delivered it to different people, you know, as, as a favor. And they visited all these different places. And they said it was a trip to Ukraine, okay? They visited all these different locations, including, you'll see on the bottom, Laboon. That picture there, um, interesting picture, this is Lewis, uh, who would be uh, Peter's grandfather, and he actually is the um, brother of my great-grandmother. Okay. Um, this is a, such a strange picture. I don't, it was, my first thought was maybe it was Purim or something. They're all dressed up really strangely. But in fact, when I looked at them, you know, when they went over and I saw, found manifests from this, when they came back, it was actually, you know, in the fall. So it wasn't Purim time. So I don't know what they were doing, but I have interesting relatives. What can I tell you? Um, so here's a map of all the different places that they went. And, you know, checking maps is always a good thing. So when I look, first of all, as they said, it was Ukraine. So that immediately dropped out that Lubyan Kuyaski that I showed you to the west of Warsaw. So now I'm kind of focusing already on Ukraine. And But when I looked at where, all the ones in blue are where Lewis and Bernard went. Lubny, which was the other town, which they did not visit apparently, is to the west, this is Kiev here, so it's, I'm sorry, to the east, thank you, to the east of uh, Kiev, and all the rest of these are, are t to the west. Um, so, you know, I'm starting to feel like, well, maybe we're kind of not in the Lubny area. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention on this is when, uh, the other story that, that Peter told me is that when his father, his father, particularly his grandfather, went to Laboon, that locals met him at the boundary, at the outskirts of town, with bread and salt, which in Ukraine is the way that people welcome back home people from their hometown. So, you know, d definitely they were from Laboon, apparently, according to the story. So this is where I was then after this initial research. I had some documents in my family that seemed to indicate that Laboon, that they were from Laboon or Lubin. Um, Lewis Meyer's Ukraine trip seemed to, it definitely included Laboon, and there was family stories that that was his hometown. There were a few researchers on Jewish Chen who also felt that Laboon and Lubin, despite other information, seemed to, or lack of information, seemed to feel that this was the same community. Um, on the other hand, I had no gazetteer, I had gazetteers that said if there was the name Lubin, it was associated with the community of Lubni. That was the Yiddish term for Lubni. Um, I had gazetteers that talked about the town of Laboon and never indicated that it had any other name. 
in any other language. And finally, I had um, online sources that identified my Lelanzmannschaft, the first Lubiner Progressive Benevolent Association, with the town of either Lubni or Lublin, not Laboon. <laughs> so one of the things I did was I was actually, based upon you know, the stuff on this side, I was feeling pretty good that I had the right information, so I contacted um, Steve Lasky from the Museum of Family History, the one who did the study of the cemetery gates, and I said, you know, I don't think that the town is Lubni that you have. It's, it's, it's Lab I'm sure it's Laboon. Um, would you please fix that? And he said, okay. And so he changed it for identifying those towns, uh, identifying those cemetery gates and that Lansmannschaft to recognize that it was the town, it represented the town of Laboon. So I was, then I was feeling really good. So I said, I'm going to approach Jewish Jen and say, you know, I looked at your um, community's database and you don't list Lubin as an alternative name for Laboon. Would you please do that? And they um, said, no, uh, if your town was called Lubin, it was Lubni. And that Laboon was never called Lubin, and by the way, your family is from Lubni. You know, you can get mad. Um, but it actually, I guess I'm the kind of person where I started doubting myself a little bit. I thought, well, I, I don't doubt, I, I felt strongly that this was, my, my thought was probably correct. But I looked at the evidence that I had, and I really didn't feel like I had enough to argue the case. I couldn't produce any map you know, that would show that name, Lubin, on a map that showed in the same place as Laboon. I couldn't produce any document. I had a lot of hearsay and a lot of people who would shake their head and say yes, but I didn't have any documentation. So I started thinking, I want to make this case. How can I do that in a convincing fashion? So I read widely in genealogy, well beyond just Jewish genealogy, because I always feel like other people might have good ideas too. And one of the things I learned about is something that's used quite a bit in genealogy these days. It's called the Genealogical Proof Standard. It was developed by the Board for Certification of Genealogists, which is a professionalizing kind of organization. And essentially what it uh, outlines is best practices for reaching accurate conclusions in genealogy. Now, this is, as I said, a professionalizing organization. They certify genealogists at, cert at, a, at a professional level. Um, but it's not just for professionals. It's really for anybody who wants to do good, accurate research. They have some good ideas. You don't have to be a professional. Um, and uh, if you want to learn about the genealogical proof standard, I suggest, you know, the seminal work these days is Thomas W. Jones Mastering Genealogical Proof, and that is in your handout. You don't need to write it down if you don't wish to. It, the genealogical proof standard has five elements to it, and I will go through them in a few slides. Just list them here quickly. You conduct thorough research. You cite the sources that you use as you do your research. You analyze and assess the quality of your sources' information and evidence, and then you, you compare and contrast them. And then if you have any conflicts among the evidence that you're collecting, you want to try to resolve those conflicts as to you know which would, is really the correct answer. And then, and this is kind of the, one of the critical parts, is you want to write it up. Don't just you know keep it in your head and say, isn't that good and wonderful, look at the great job I've done. Share it with other people so that somebody else doesn't have to do the same thing again. So the genealogical proof standard, I like to think of it in this way, in a, in a graphic. All the parts, those five elements, are interdependent. You cannot meet the standard unless you do all of that. Now, the only part that you could ever leave out would be conflict resolution there in the center. And you could leave that out if you don't have any conflicts. Now, if you're working on a complex project, a complex question, chances are there are some conflicts in your information. Um, if you're working on one that's not so complex, you, you may not have conflicts, but, but most of us, when we get into these complex questions, we have to also address the conflicts before we meet the genealogical proof standard. 
So the first element, thorough research. It's also known as reasonably exhaustive search, which is a term that has often gets quite a bit of discussion. Now, I think most of us at 2 o'clock in the morning, we know exactly what exhaustive search feels like or exhaustive research, right? Um, the question is, how does one make it reasonable? And the way we make it reasonable, it, we'll think of it as comprehensive research in a variety of relevant sources. And relevant really is the key word. If you ask a good research question, you don't need to use a shotgun approach and collect everything in the world about that question. Uh, I'm sorry, about that re ancestor. But you do need to collect everything you can that's relevant to that particular research question. And the way you do that is you develop a focused research question. And I've had this discussion with some genealogists who go, well, all I'm interested in is to find out about my ancestor's life. And I said, well, you can't really research someone's life in an operational sense. What aspect of their life do you want to research? Okay. In this case, I want to research where they came from. Okay. That's a more focused research problem. And I can, I know what records I need to look at in order to do that. And once I finish that, then I can look at something else about them. And maybe I want to, you know, maybe I'm interested in how they got to the United States, or maybe I'm interested in their occupation. Uh, one of the things I found that's fascinating is that so many people from this town, when they came to New York, they all became glaziers. It's really interesting. I have tons of glaziers in my family. It, uh, that's one of the ways I can tell they're part of my family. If I find a name similar, and they have, and they're a glazier, go, up, oh, that's it, you know. <laughs> Research this person further, they're probably from my family. Um, and actually, a lot of people from this town became glaciers. It's, it's amazing. Um, not a real great profession these days, but it was apparently around the turn of the century. What I like to consider this thorough research is my no surprises offense. It would be bad if I stood up here and almost immediately after I finished my presentation, you raise your hand and say, but you forgot this, this, and this. That could happen. No one's perfect, but I'm working so that it doesn't. Okay, So I want to think about every resource I can think of that would re reflect on Give me some information, some evidence on the question that I'm asking. Cite your sources. This is real bugaboo with a lot of us. It takes a lot of time. But there are some really good reasons. Personal resource, personal research tracking. Um, how many of you have ever bought the same book twice? Yeah. <laughs> We've all done that. I'll tell you what I did recently. I just like, I couldn't even believe it. So I'm working on ancestry and I found this great record. I was very excited. It was really relevant to what the question I was asking. I have this kind of a, my own little structure of how I, uh, how I file things on my computer. So I downloaded it and I file, tried to file it. And it said, are you replacing the document that's already there? And I looked at that, I thought, well, when did I find this? I don't remember this at all. It was like three months before, you know? So it really helps to, when we do our research, write down what we're doing so we don't waste our time. Now, you know, most of us were doing this in our own time, but we don't need to waste our time, you know, even for us. You know, we we want to make progress. So why do the same thing over and over and over? Um, the other thing is it documents our findings. And, and I'll tell you, one of the most telling things I ever did, I took a class from Boston University on uh, genealogical research. And one of the things they had us do was chart, uh, basically write down our research steps as we were solving a problem. And write down, you know, cite your sources while you're doing that. It was amazing because you can actually see what your thought process is. Rather than like zipping through ancestry or zipping through family search, grabbing every record you can, you actually document your thought process. How did, why did I think I needed to look for that next record? You know, what was I looking for and why did I select that record? And then you kind of understand your own research process. It's, it's fascinating. You can also support your statements. After you've developed your proof statements, you want to know how you got there. So when you cite your sources, knowing what you looked at, it can help you. Um, it communicates to other people what you did. So if another researcher is looking at the same question or the same family, they can look at that and say, okay, did they do a good job? And it also helps you ultimately when you're doing your analysis of the evidence that you've brought to bear on the research question, 
did I use quality sources? Are these good sources or are they, you know, do they really bear any weight? Particularly when you have conflicts, it's really important to know that. The gold standard for citing your sources is Elizabeth Schoen Mill's book, Evidence Explained. Again, this is on your handout. You don't need to write it down. Um, but I did notice, actually, she seems lately to be coming out with a new version about every other year. And this one is, she's got a new version out this year. So this is 2015. There's a, a fourth edition that just recently came out that I don't have. I forgot to update this. If you never read anything else in genealogy, I would suggest, and this is a one fat book, it's a little squat thing, but really fat, about 900 pages, I think, um, every idea about how to possibly cite a source. But if you never read anything else in genealogy, the first chapter of this book is really, really wonderful. You can probably find this in any good genealogy library if you don't want to buy it yourself. It's about 50 or 60 bucks. But it's an excellent, ex her first chapter is just wonderful. Anyway, moving on. Uh, then the next part of uh, another element is analyzing your sources, the information that you find, and the evidence. You want to, uh, the basic idea is you want to go for original sources if you can, uh, or, co or you know, images of original sources. And the reason why is because original sources were created pretty close to an event that occurred. So in general, there is less likely to be errors. We all know, you know, if you've seen, um, Ma uh, death, re death records, for example, where some grandson or granddaughter identified who the deceased parents were. Well, they may not have ever known, and they weren't obviously there. So, and, and you also know, you know, if you've looked at indexes, that as we get iterations of original records, mistakes can creep in. So, the gold standard on this would really be, if you can find an original record, don't just use an index. Uh, don't just use a transcription or an abstract. We got the other thing we, that's good to do whenever we look at records, particularly when we're getting them off various websites, most websites when they have a collection that's been indexed, um, they have a description of that collection. It's always good to read the description of the collection. We tend not to do that. We tend to jump in and start our research. But it's important to look at it because you might learn more about why those records were collected and it's also important to know the history of an area. Um, for example, uh, revision lists are, are, are interesting in, in the Russian Empire. They're, they're very similar to census records that we use in the United States. The big difference is that they were collected for two main reasons, to collect taxes from people and, to, and for military conscription. And because of that, a lot of times when the person there is essential, you know, the, the person coming around from the Russian Empire to document people for the revision list, a lot of the Jews would disappear. They didn't want to be, you know, on the, on the military uh, conscription list, and they certainly didn't want to pay taxes. So all the town would empty out. <laughs> so if you don't, you know, if you're looking at a, trans, uh, a revision list from, from the Russian Empire, you don't find your people, it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't live there. It just meant they might have disappeared. So it's important to know that kind of history and what's going on. There's a really nice article that I like. This isn't the only one, but it's, it's, it's a good one, and, and it bears a little bit on this uh, presentation. There was an article by uh, Sally Ann uh, Sakpikas a few years ago, 2009, in uh, Abu Tenu, where she had the question, you know, we look at these manifests, passenger manifests all the time. How did the information that's on the manifest get there? Who put it there? And she sat down with Marion Smith, who's a historian from the Immigration Service, and the two of them chatted, and she wrote up this art, uh, uh, Sally Ann wrote up this article, describing how the in, most of the information about the individuals who were on the manifest was collected at the time tickets were sold. So if their immigrant relative in the United States purchased, purchased the ticket, they were the ones providing a lot of the information. If the immigrant to be purchased their ticket in their small community, which could have happened because agents went around and sold tickets, then that information was given to the agent. Then all this information was collated by a clerk at the port of departure and put on this big manifest. So there's lots of places where you could get mistakes entering, you know, coming in to that process. So those are good things to know 
it explains a lot just by itself as to why the manifests look like they do sometimes. As an interesting sidelight, um, my, uh, on my father's mother's side, the name in the old country was Mazowitzki. And when my great-grandfather came to the United States, he changed his last name to Morris. He came over as Mazowitzki. Five years later, when his family came over, he bought the tickets for them in New York, and he identified them as Morris, even though they were still living in Ukraine and had never changed their name. Okay. So when I found them, their name, they were found as, as Morris. Okay, continuing on, trust no one, records lie. Okay? And all these kind of things I've told you. So you always need to check all the information you find on records, understand the record. Um, is the source original? We talked about that. As you move away from an original source with transcriptions uh, and copies and even indexes, uh, and you'll, uh, if, if it's a derivative source like that, a copy, a translation, a transcript, an abstract, um, an index, you may get additional errors creeping in. Um, if it's an author, is it an author thing, like a gazetteer or a Yiskor book or a compiled genealogy? You know, then you've got people putting their own opinions in or their own interpretations of what happened. Uh, so these are all things that are getting further and further away from what actually happened. We always need to ask, who was the informant? Did they know what they were saying? Were, there ac were they actually an eyewitness to the event for which they're providing information or not? And then what we want to do when we're doing our analysis is we look at different pieces of information that we've collected and we compare and contrast them from different documents. We may find when we do that that there are conflicts. And if there are, then and a conflict is a contradictory answer to the same question. If there are unresolved conflicts, you can't meet the genealogical proof standard. If there are conflicts, then we resolve them by a number of different things. We want to use more than one record, one, more than one record if we can, to collect evidence on our particular topic. So the weight of the evidence from multiple and independent sources. Now, an independent source really is independent sources are re, are documents that would have been created for different reasons or with information from different people, different informants. For example, a lot of times you get a death certificate that will say what the parents, the parents of the deceased's name were, names were. Um, and then you get a tombstone, and sometimes they match, and sometimes they don't. I have a situation where they don't. I have one is where it says the father's name was Israel. On the other one, it says his name was Shabtai. Now, the problem I have is it's pretty clear that those some two different people must have provided the information for the death certificate and the tombstone, but I don't have information for either of those as to who the people were who provided the information. So those are independent, apparently, maybe, but totally different information, and I can't tell which one should be better than the other. Uh, so that's why we want to know who's providing the information and why the record was created and all those different things. Um, finally, we want to do a well-reasoned and written conclusion. It should reflect your thorough research, your citations, your analysis. Uh, I wanted to mention this article is a really good example. This article by Terry Tillman uh, is about uh, a Trace Pauline, who was from Al a Jewish person from Alsace, who settled in New Orleans. Uh, it's, it's, this article was originally published in the National Genealogical Quarterly. Uh, Avutena saw it, loved it so much that they asked to republish it, and they did. So if you want to access it, Avutena might be more accessible to you than NGS if you haven't been the quarterly, if you haven't subscribed to that. It's an excellent article, just blew me away. <clears throat> But I also want to, and I wouldn't c compare my article anywhere near the quality of that, but I do want you to know that this research has been published in Albertino. So, and, but, but if you want to look at a really good one, look at Terry Tillman's. <clears throat> so, let's go just quickly through research planning. When we plan research, we need to identify the problem, and we try to make it really focused, because that defines our scope of what we need to look for. We analyze the existing information we have, we identify all the, and use all the sources that would be relevant to this problem, 
And then we keep on repeating steps two and three until we feel that we've reached, that we can reach a conclusion. <coughs> so it could go on forever if you never reach your conclusion. Or you could get to the point where you just say, I've looked at everything and I can't figure it out. So here's the research problem. We have a Yiddish name for a town, it's Lubin. And we also know that, um, let's see, when are we supposed to end here? Okay, I got it. Uh, we also know that we're getting information from various relatives of mine that it could possibly be the town of Laboon, which was in Volhynia Gubernia. And we also know from other people that the town of Lubny was called Lubin. That's in Poltava Gubernia on the other side of Kiev. So I worked up a problem statement. And my research statement was, was Lubin an alternative name for the community of Laboon, Volhynia, Gubernia? Now, you'll notice in that that I didn't include Lubni in that problem statement because I was trying to narrowly focus. Now, I already know, I'm not, there's no question that the Yiddish name for Lubni was Lubin. That's accepted. We find that on maps, it's, and we find that in documents. We know that. That's no question. I don't need to research that. My question is, did Laboon have another Yiddish name? So now somebody else said to me, well, why don't you just go to like the Ellis Island database and plug in the name of the town and just get, or, and the name of Lubin and Laboon and just get everybody who's ever come from those towns and compare it. And I said, well, that won't tell me what I want to know, that I know that there are people who say they're from this and there's other people who say they're from that, but how do I bring it together? So more of the same doesn't necessarily help. You have to kind of get creative. So the first thing I did was I looked at the existing sources. And I looked at where once we walked. And one of the reasons I like where once we walked, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I think I'm running a little long, is <laughs> that they cite their sources. And so for the town of Yurovshina, which is the current name of this, of Laboon in Ukraine, they changed the name after the Soviet Union went away, um, they listed three sources, COH, LDL, and SF. Now, that's under the, the, uh, the name of the town. And if you look at the front of the book, they list all these records and they tell you what they are. So COH was called Chamber of the Holocaust. It's kind of a funky thing. I tried to find this on the web. It's very difficult to find, and I consider myself a really good Googler, but this was really a challenge. And it really wound up not giving me much information. Um, it, uh, pr the best I can tell, it was sort of a precursor to Yad Vashem's uh, opportunities, uh, Yad Vashem's memorial uh, area. And supposedly they linked, they had 2,000 memorial plaques Online, I could not find Laboon at all. Um, I tried contacting them by email more than once. I was unsuccessful. Um, finally, I had a friend of mine, uh, Ronnie Golan, in uh, Israel go there. <laughs> and he, he couldn't get anything out of, out of that either. So I said, well, that's not helpful. Latter-day leaders, sages, and scholars. That's by Rosenstein and Rosenstein. That wound up being a really good book. They do cite their sources, and so that, that wound up being a, a, an opportunity. The last one, SF, is the Shtetl Finder by Chester Cohn. That essentially is a precursor to where once we walk. That's a gazetteer. The problem with him is while he does cite sources, he puts them all in the front of the book. He doesn't have a source for each town, each individual town. So you kind of know the books he used in general, but you don't know where this town was mentioned. So I decided to look further into Latter-day leaders, sages, and scholars to see what they said about Laboon. I found the book. <coughs> I think I found a used copy of it, bought, bought it. And the book essentially is like, it's a really old style thing, a lot of computer printouts. And when I looked under the town Laboon, they listed one person. What they were doing is they were trying to collect information on every single rabbi or religious leader in the old country. And so they, they would go through lots of different works. And for this town, the only one they listed was someone that they called Meyer Lerner. His father was Simcha. And 
they list a reference where they got this information from. It was reference one, page 96. So I went to the front of their book to see what was reference one. And it was a book by this fellow named Samuel Noach Gottlieb called Oh Hal Hashem. He wrote this book in 1912, and I found it online. It's a digitized work, very cool. And what Gottlieb did was he decided he wanted to collect bio little biographies, little paragraphs about every religious leader in Eastern Europe. This is 1912. So he sent out letters to everybody and got stuff back, but little biographies. Now, supposedly written by them, it might have been written by, you know, maybe their family or whatever, but he collected all these things and put them in a book. So I, my interest in looking at this was to see if Meyer Lerner's biography would maybe mention the name Lubin. But I was sorely disappointed. Okay. So he, it was, they mentioned Laboon, Wabun, and Laboon. So that didn't do it for me, but I checked that source and that's as far as I got. So then I thought, you know, I started looking at where once we walked that, that was, that was the extent, those three sources. And I started looking at some other towns nearby to Laboon, and I thought, you know, they had a lot more sources cited for them. Why is it that they, even though they were comparable in size, like Gritsev and Polonoya, why did they have so many more resources mentioned than Laboon? That struck me as peculiar. So I looked at the sources, and the one that really stuck out was this one by Beryl Kagan. That was, that was available for, they mentioned Gritsev and they mentioned Polonoya, two local towns on either side of Laboon. Now, this is called uh, Sefer Hatfri Nuvaratan. I also found it online. Very cool. It's, it's uh, digitized by the uh, Yiddish Book Center. And what Kagan did in 1975 is he said, I want to reconstruct all the different towns in Eastern Europe. How can I do that? What happened was, at the turn of the century and in the 19th century, when someone wanted to create a religious text, they would go out to all these different communities, to the religious leaders in these communities, and say, I want to write this book and publish it. Would you pre-subscribe to it so that I have the money to publish it? And when I do that, your name will be shown in the front of the book. And so that's what they did. So there are many of these religious texts from this time period with these long lists of towns and people from those towns. It's a, it's a gold mine of that kind of information. And Beryl Kagan put it all together into a book. So I struggled to use this book because it's, it's very complex in the way he structured it. I want to let you know you don't need to struggle. After I finished struggling and figured out how to use it, I discovered that Jewish Gen in their info files have a very nice article telling you how to use it. Okay, and so this article by Tom Chat is very useful, and that's also in your handout. So what did I find? What I found was in the back of the book where he's got a geographical index, there was no listing for the town of Laboon. There was a listing for Gritsev, there was a listing for Polonoya, so all those other towns were in there, but not Laboon. So I thought, well, wait a second, what happened to Laboon? All right, so I decided to go through the first part of the book, which was all in Hebrew, looking for the name, I looked, started with Lamed, okay, in that section, to see if I could find anything that vaguely looked like Laboon. And I, I wanted to say, actually, yeah, the first, the first part is in, you know, in, in Latin text, so it's easy for us to read. First part is the main part of the book, it's huge. And so I looked at, looked through that, and I did find this reference, and this is for, the, he gives numbers to the towns. So town number 4177, was he listed it as it looks like Lab, Labin, Labin, okay? But then in question with a question mark he wrote Laboon, okay? So he had this name and he wasn't sure what it was. He couldn't tie it to anything. So he was thinking, could it have been Laboon? But he uh, Lubin, but he wasn't sure. So that I'm thinking maybe because he wasn't sure, he didn't put it in the back of the book in the geographical index. But that's just. And then he lists his sources. Where did he get this from? You know, what book did he find the prenumeration list in? It was a book called Haray Basamim uh, that was published in 1902. Now this number three here indicates that in Haray Basamim there were three subscribers listed for this book. 
from that town. Well, so then I needed to get, I wanted to get this book. And I could not find it online, but I did use WorldCat. Are you familiar with WorldCat? It's a catalog of basic of, of library materials. And in WorldCat, they said this book, a one place that has this book is the Jewish Theological Seminary's library. Well, at the time, Janet Silverman, who's a well-known genealogist and a good friend of mine, was working at HJTS. So I said, Janet, you need to go to the library for me. And she did. And with two tries, she actually found the book. And this is where, this is that front piece with all the list. And it, my goal here was to figure out, my first thought was maybe Kagan made a typo, okay? Or somebody else did a typo. Maybe I'd find it as Lubin here. But no, it does say Laboon. Uh, I'm sorry, Labin. Labin. And then um, it listed three names, and the names were Yisrael Alperin, Shmuel Kantorchik, and there was a Beit Midrash called, uh, with someone named Shmuel Shov. Now, I was hoping I might get some names of people that I could recognize from my town, and I have to say that there is somebody from my town, from another researcher whose grandfather's name was Yisrael Alperin. The problem with that name is Yisrael Alperin is kind of a common name. Alperin's not an unusual name. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got that, but I'm not sure. The other two, I've, n I've never seen anybody named Shmuel Shaov. I don't know about any bait midrashes. I recently have seen a name of, a, a maiden name of someone that was close to Kantorchik, so it's possible, but it didn't give me everything I wanted. Basically, what I've been doing is, is, um, moving through, peeling off layers of misinformation. Um, and, but I want to move on to another, something else I did, and I've got to kind of pick it up here. Um, I did look at the Landsmannschafts, and I looked at the burial records. I went and I collected, I, I recorded the, the Landsmannschafts, um, because my feeling was, you know, when people are in a Landsmannschaft burial plot, they are self-identifying as being from that town. In the case of this town, it, it creates kind of a community of records. And in the case of this town, and I'm going to zip through this quickly, it, this Blansmanshaft was started in, 19, in 1911, um, and there are three burial plots in New York, and the cemetery plots, you get a lot of these where they eventually, when people got older, they joined with other towns. This one apparently never did, okay? So it's pretty pure in that sense. So I decided, I recorded all the burials that I could in all three plots, and I wanted to determine the shtetl that was associated with this first Lubiner Progressive Benevolent Association. I wanted, my objective was to identify the shtetl of each immigrant. And my expectation was that there would be an overall strong correlation with one town or another. Um, ultimately, there were 204 burials. Um, I recorded all those, and they're up on Jober. Um, and then I basically researched people all the different immigrants to see if I could link them with their manifest records and their naturalization records. Ultimately, I did that, was able to do that successfully with 66 of the people. Basically, what I was doing was starting with the death record, the tombstone, and not necessarily working in this order, but these were the kinds of records I was linking back and forth to make sure that this person was the same person that I found on the manifest. So just to give you a, a quick show, this is one person, he's not related to me as far as I know. His name was Meyer Schultz. His wife was also buried there. Um, she shows up, this is a census record, she shows up there. Um, this is his World War II record. Uh, she also shows up as his wife there. He's got his petition for naturalization, she's on there. And I actually did find his... Um, Manifest, his name originally actually was Meyer Scouts. But you can see, now these are all the records that are correlate, I'm correlating this information. So you can see, I've got Lubin, Lubin, Laboon, um, I've got, uh, his age, his birth date, where he's from, his children, his wife, and actually found out that his original name was not Schultz, it was Scouts on his manifest. So I was able to go through all this and, and make that connection by really going through all the records. Um, then I created a spreadsheet for all these people. Ultimately, I found that 26 of the 66 really identified it pretty much Lubin with various spelling variations as their town of origin. 15 people said Laboon. There were six people who 
kind of were in between. Sometimes on some records they said Lubin, sometimes they said Laboon. And then there were 19 people who didn't, rec who didn't identify that town at all. Um, the ones I wanted to look at further then were those last two on the list because those were most interesting to me. Those are the kind of the outliers. Why is that? Um, so this is just a kind of a mini version of what the spreadsheet kind of looked like. I had various particular records that I looked at and what they said on that record for this particular research problem. Okay, I just had to extract what was relevant. Um, there, I said there were six. There's actually seven people on this because I wanted to talk about Isidore Bauman. Isidore Bauman married in New York another woman who was a woman from the same town and she was Ida Bauman. She came over with her family, Ida Maltzman, with her family from what her family said was Laboon, both on her manifest and on the naturalization record. Isidore actually came to the United States twice, once a year or two before Ida and once a year later. And the first manifest, he identified the town as Lobin, and the second is Lubin. On his World War I draft, it was Laboon, and then World War II, Lubin. Okay. And you can see the same for Joseph Proslow, Moses, uh, Morris Reitman. They, you know, they kind of were covering everything. Meyer Schultz, I just showed you. Now this one is interesting, Yoer Lerner. Remember we talked about Rabbi Lerner, Yair, I'm sorry, Meyer Lerner. I actually think I found a mistake in Kagan's, in Harai Besamim, that <clears throat> this guy was actually not Meyer Lerner. I think it was probably a typo. His name is Yoer Lerner. He was brought over to the United States by the Landsmannschaft. He was the rabbi of Lubin. And he, his father was Simcha. He's the same as the guy mentioned and born the same time. So I think that book actually has a mistake. I've got several records for this guy. And he too, on his manifest it said Laboon, on his naturalization, Lubin. So ultimately I had 19 immigrants from other communities. What I found is they were all from geographically close shtetls and, 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 or they, or they had kinship with people who were from Laboon or Lubin. Um, so they could be from the local town Polone or from Gretziv. Uh, or they were affiliated, even though they were completely different, they were affiliated with people, they were in-laws or they married into the family. Some, uh, so you could, there was a way of showing that they were related to somebody who was from the town. The only ones that I couldn't figure out was this Joseph and Hannah Fell. Um, on their manifest it said they were from Odessa. The, I, the, Joseph's tombstone doesn't list a father. Um, the only thing I was able to show is that uh, uh, Yetta fell. Um, she wound up, uh, I'm sorry, Yetta Myers, who's buried there. She's married into my Myers family. Her maiden name was Fell. So it's possible they're related to her some town, but, uh, but her, her, or unfortunately, her uh, tombstone doesn't have her father's name either. Um, so there were 66 immigrants. 47 were from Lubin or Laboon or both. 17 could be linked to relatives from Lubin or Laboon, two possibly from there. I'm going to move on to another way of approaching the problem. This is my Kehila Links website. That picture you see there is the only known picture from of a Jewish building in the town of Laboon. Now, when I first started my research, this was kind of floating around the internet. I didn't know where it came from. I figured out that it actually was a photograph that was owned by the Joint Distribution Committee because in 1923 they did a project there rebuilding or, or restoring the bathhouse. And this is the bathhouse. I contacted JDC and said I would like to get permission from you to use this photograph on my website. And they said sure, after I paid them some money. And <laughs> then they, I said to them, well you've got this, or do you have any documents? from this project and they said no. I said, oh, well I'm surprised by that, but okay. Well, fast forward to a few years later, they have been madly docu uh, do uh, digitizing, I'm sorry, their archives. When you hear talks from them, they always seem to be really emphasizing people doing searches in their all name index. But I tried that and I didn't find any names of my relatives or very many. What I did in this case, since I was interested in a town, was I put in Lubin. I also put in Laboon. It works with Soundex, apparently. And when I did that, 
I found eight documents associated actually with this 1923 project. So when I talked to them several years ago, they didn't realize I had that, and then when they started documenting, apparently they found it, and now I can look at it. Now, these are not indexed. The only way they're, the only way you access them is by the title that they put in. So there's a, you know, it's associated with a town, but you can't, in, you can't look at it for individual names. Okay? But you might want to look at it for your town, if they did any projects there. I found on there that there was a receipt among these documents, and they're all documents that they sent out. Unfortunately, it's not documents that came into them. You don't see the other part of the correspondence, which is unfortunate. But they sent it, they had sent something to an organization called Lubin Relief. They had a letter to M. Myers, Secretary of Lubin Relief. Now, I had a relative named Meyer Myers. He was my great-grandmother's, another brother of that guy, Lewis, and my great-grandmother. And I was able to match the address with an address that Meyer, that my Meyer Myers had. Uh, they identified the village that they were going to do this project in as Lubin, Zaslav Uyezd, Volin, Gubernia, which was the same Uyezd and Gubernia that Laboon is in. Um, they named a bunch of townspeople. They then all talked about people receiving relief, and then they had this letter in there that was titled Lubin Relief and in parentheses Laboon. And then a document that went along with that that said just these, the same thing in another way. So it's like, yes, yes. Um, but I never stopped. So one of the letters, one of the letters showed, it, it was very poignant, it was talking about, it was, it was a report, and it talked about the state of the, of the village after the Russian Revolution and how bad things were. And it said that there were two teachers in Lubin uh, who were half starved and only occasionally receiving insignificant sums of pay. And one of them was Munya Boxer, and the other one was a woman named Zusa Zak from Lubin. Then they gave them like $10 each. So I was curious to see what happened to these people. So I looked on Yad Vashem, and I was able to find Zusa Zak. Uh, remember, she was identified as being from Lubin. The POT says Laboon. She was a teacher. She lived in Laboon, and she was murdered in Polonoya in 1941. So in conclusion, basically, you know, how did I do? I wanted to do this stuff using the GPS. I did thorough research. I tried to link Laboon and Lubin, used a variety of independent sources, a variety of methods of coming at the problem. I used gazetteers, burial records from the uh, cemetery, archival records that were all independently created and could be contrasted and uh, looked at. I documented my sources with citations. I did analysis and correlation. I went back to originals and pushed it back as far as I could. I compared and contrasted things that I found. For instance, you know, in one thing I found Meyer Lerner uh, and the other one I found Yair Lerner. I could tell that they were probably the same person. Um, and then I tried to, when I had conflicts, I tried to explain them and I wrote it up. So when you have conflicting evidence, you want to search for the origins of the information. There's a lot of garbage out there. Sometimes you're going to have to dig. That's just the way it is. Um, I wanted to let you know that more recently I did reapproach Jewish Gen, and now if you go to the Yerovshina page, you will find that Lubin is listed as an alternative. And I want to say, you know, I don't want to give Jewish Gen a bad name. In fact, I am very, uh, I am have a lot of gratitude for them because they pushed me. They pushed me to learn how to do good research, to really prove my case. I could have said it's Laboon and gone off to Ukraine and gone to Lubny. <laughs> I could have gone to the wrong place. And that happens. When I was in Ukraine visiting, uh, I hired Alex Dunai a few years ago, and he, and he and I had this conversation, and he said he's had this bad situation where people come over there telling him this is the town, they set it all up, and he starts looking at it and realizes it's not their town. Don't let that happen to you. Make sure you have the right place. In summary, you want to apply rigorous methods and techniques to assure your results are sound. I suggest you use the genealogical proof standard this is Laboon, where I visited. Um, and I did want to ask you to please remember to click that little on your app. If you click that little clipboard, you can review my presentation. And I thank you very much.